Na bila shaka mtazamaji hayo ndio makubaliano kuhusu hali ya anga barani Afrika ambayo yameweza kuwasilishwa na vijana. Vijana hapo wakitaka tu kwa wakuu wa dunia kuchukua hatua ya mabadiliko ya tabia nchi ni makubaliano ambayo yaweza kuwasilishwa mapema hii leo. Na mtazamaji kufikia hapo sina la ziada kwa sasa na weka kijiti katika mashauriano yetu ama pia mahojiano yetu ya swala zima la kongamano la Afrika. Kongamano hili ambalo limeza kamilika siku hii ya leo kwa ndio siku ya tatu na kwa sasa mtazamaji nitakuwa na mrushia mwenzangu Zainabu Ndati na muona yuko hapa kando atakuwa anatujuza mengi tu kusiana na kilichojiri katika kongamano hili na pia kuna wajumbe tofauti ambao atakuwa anazungumza nao lakini nakuacha na hili mtazamaji kwamba fursa ya kipekee kwa kila mtu duniani ni kushiriki katika kuamua mustakabal wa ulimwengu fursa ya kipekee kwa kila mtu duniani ni kushiriki tu katika kuamua mustakabal wa ulimwengu Kenya ni yetu sote na Afrika ni yetu sote siku zote ni tafrida mwaka nitaitika kwa sasa ni zamu ya Zainab Wandati Zainab tujuze mengi Shukran Shukran sana Frida Mwaka ndio London siku ya mwisho ya kongamano la Afrika la Africa Climate Summit na hapa niko na wenzangu hapa kwenye studio wananiangalia nilikuwa nashangaa mbona naongea kwa Kiswahili kama tusongea kwa Kiswahili <laughs> No we will speak in English <laughs> You cannot breathe a sigh of relief. We, can, we will speak in English. Yeah. So today is the last day of the Africa Climate Summit. And the Nairobi Declaration has been adopted, but it was adopted in a closed session. We had hoped that it would be a public plenary session so that everyone could follow um, the presentation of that document. So there are whispers that the document is out. Then there are whispers that the document that you see going around is not the final document. It's a, a, it's a decoy, a draft. You know, so many words being thrown around. But the key point to, to note is that today is the final day of the summit and what's expected out of the end of the day today is the Nairobi declaration. Now this Nairobi declaration is expected to be taken as the Africa position which will then be taken to the COP28 and guide the negotiations for Africa, what Africa wants out of this summit. And one of the key things that the president was looking to look with this summit is to change the nature of, of, of discussions of climate change and move it away from the beggar point of view where Africa has often been begging for help and move it away from that point of view and then look at it from the solutions point of view. Unfortunately, we haven't seen very many solutions here today except the electric vehicle that uh, the president has been moving around with. Although today we've seen a lot of uh, his motorcade involved, um, including so many fuel guzzlers. So yeah. I don't know <laughs> yeah. I don't know why he had. Yeah. But the Nairobi Declaration, um, the document itself, uh, the draft document itself, uh, from what I've, ha I've heard is that um, it was done in a closed session and then some amendments were done, some, some uh, proposals, additions and uh, omissions were suggested and so it's expected to be revised and then the final document is expected again later to do this evening for translation tomorrow and then distribution to everywhere in the world by next week. So let's talk about this declaration. Let me introduce my panel here today. I'm glad we have some women. We've been talking to a lot of men, but I'm glad we have some, <laughs> we have some women. Right next to me is Leah Otieno, who's a senior research associate, Africa Research Impact Network. Leah is not a very happy person here today. Uh, she has some feelings about the research yeah. industry being left out of these discussions. Yeah. Next to Leah, we have Amos Wemanya, who's a climate policy expert with Power Shift Africa. And then last but not least, we have Grace Rono, uh, who Energy Access Div uh, Advisor at RICOS. We had hoped that the Africa um, Group of Negotiators uh, uh, Chair would join us. We are still hopeful that he's going to join us, but given the activities of today and the document not being the final one, maybe he may not be able to make it. But if he does, we will make room for him. So let me start with Lea. Why are you not happy with this draft Nairobi declaration? I mean, I'm going to be a bit biased here because I expected some amplification of the research and evidence community. We know that the document has been worked on behind doors. Mm -hmm. um, we'd have expected a bit of transparency. Let us see, let us hear the arguments that are being put forth. Mm -hmm. Research and evidence is very, very key when you're talking about climate change because the, we have the facts, we have the figures, we know why certain interventions need to be made in certain ways. Mm -hmm. we we know why certain vulnerable groups should be prioritized mm -hmm. over even other parts of this population. So mm -hmm. the role of research cannot really be overstated in mm -hmm. this in this context. Mm -hmm. And also another aspect is just the fact that this is a document that has not been open to 
other groups of people who may have had useful input. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to say that it's not a progressive document. I've had mm -hmm. a look at the draft mm -hmm. that is uh, circulating. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of political responsibility, a lot of goodwill that is in there, a lot of shifting from the beggar attitude, from the beggar perspective, very progressive. Mm -hmm. But most importantly, we want to see how is evidence being consolidated. Because when we go to COP28, when you're talking about loss and damage, it's more, it's more than the advocacy aspect. Mm -hmm. We want to look at the facts, we want to look at the figures, we want to know, um, quote unquote, the, the Kenyans say, kwa ground, but yeah. you know, you'll not know unless you actively engage the research community. Mm -hmm. Amos, you've looked at the document. What does it say? Uh, the thing is, first, uh, I would like just to describe the process. Uh, when um, this Africa Climate Summit was conceived, uh, we were very happy because we thought this a moment for Africa to set its climate agenda. Uh, but I think from the document that I'm, I'm seeing, uh, it has fallen short of our expectations. Mm. Um, in the sense that, um, as we say, we want to move away from being beggars. Mm. Of course, we have not been begging. The thing is, we've been asking rich countries, historical polluters, who have developed on the back of emissions, to pay us reparations. <laughs> you heard John Kerry say nothing like that is ever going to happen. Yeah, and, and, and <laughs> they need to take responsibility. Mm. That's what we've been calling for. Mm. We've not been begging. Mm. We've been asking. You've caused us all these problems. Mm. The droughts. Our communities are losing livelihoods. Mm. Families are being displaced. Mm. We need reparations for mm. this. And I, I think the document would have been done as justice mm. if that would have been addressed. But they have you. looked at the issue of debt. And, and global financial architecture, restructuring and reform, reforms. Mm. I think that's a good thing in, in, in the document that I've seen, but mm. there are other things that I need to address. Yes, before we talk about what you don't like about that document, which clearly is a lot, let's talk about what is in the document itself. What is in the document? What, what have, from what you've seen, what is in the document? What's in the document, um, I think, is a repetition of some of the things that um, have already been discussed in various forums, including a first down of call. That was discussed in COP26 two face years ago. Down. Yeah, face so it's down. saying face down, not face out. We need to face out. Mm. But the document says face, face down, down of coal. Mm. Mm. So we need to face out actually all fossil fuels. I was expecting Africa to be ambitious in mm. developing an energy future, mm. uh, uh, an energy system of the future. Mm. Uh, but still, they are very slow mm. on um, uh, um, facing out fossil fuels. Mm. Now, uh, Grace, what are your thoughts of the Nairobi Declaration? Uh, thank you very much. Um, for me, um, I think I will start on uh, the positive um, on the declaration. Mm. Is that uh, there has been a resounding call for the reform of the multilateral development banks. Um, these are the people who determine um, how the investments on climate and energy really do go because mm. they're the biggest investors in the region. Mm. So uh, the resounding call from all um, national governments uh, to support the re MDB reforms mm. and to make debt um, accessible and to provide uh, concessional debts and uh, grants is very useful. So um, I think this is a good discussion coming out of this, mm. and I'm looking forward to carrying this discussion forward mm. uh, to the World Bank um, annuals uh, meetings, which is happening very soon. So to me, that's one good thing that has come out of this. And uh, secondly, on the other side of things, I feel that um, we have not addressed the key issues that brought us to Nairobi. Mm. Um, we are talking about energy access and energy transition. Mm. We have not uh, rejected uh, calls uh, for fossil fuels divestment. Mm. Uh, we are still talking about um, face down. At this point, we are supposed to be talking about moving to renewables 100%. Do you yeah. think, though, there's, given that you're from the energy industry yourself, do you think it's really possible for Africa to outrightly say that we reject fossil fuels, considering some of our economies are built on fossil, on fossil fuels? Look at uh, Sudan, look at Nigeria, look at South Africa. They're built on fossil fuels. Kenya itself has fossil fuel projects happening up north. Do you think it's possible for Africa to actually say no to fossil fuels? Good question. Yes, so um, I'll just give you a perspective in terms of um, energy um, access and uh, for the last mile, or what we are calling now first mile. Mm. When you look at um, uh, using uh, fossils and the different uh, large-scale investments on um, 
uh, energy, you realize that it is not reaching out to the last person. Mm. So um, we are saying that despite all these um, investments in fossil fuels, we still have 600 million people who lack uh, access to energy. Mm. And uh, secondly, remember that we have vast resources. Africa is actually carrying more than 60 percent of uh, renewable energy resources mm. uh, in the region. Mm. So what we are saying is that we need to start thinking about a transition plan as a region. We have several um, governments which have started thinking about a transition plan. Mm. And uh, we know that it might take time, but it's something, a discussion that we need to start having right now. Mm. So that in the next five years, how are we looking at um, going into 100% renewables and phasing out uh, some of the uh, fossils that we are really mm. dependent on right now. Mm. So I think, uh, Zainab, to tell you that Africa, we don't need to rely on fossils. We have the resources. Mm. We just need to organize ourselves and to do an introspection on how we can plan for this. Yes. And this can be achieved if we put um, in place a very good uh, transition plan that can support that. Okay. Uh, Amos, you look like you want to, re to say something about that. I like you said that um, there are economies in Africa that depend Actually, yes. on fossil fuels. Mm. Actually, fossil fuels is not new in Africa. Mm. We have had Angola and Nigeria and so many African countries exploiting their fossil fuel resources. Mm. And uh, what this kind of energy system has done on the continent, it has left the continent poor, mm. despite the many promises that this system mm -hmm. has had. It has promised us revenue, for example. Uh, but if um, the fossil fuel industry uh, is uh, keeping, would have kept its promise of providing revenue, mm. then Nigeria would be the richest country in the world. Yeah. We would be lending the West, yeah. isn't it? Yes. But yes. it has yes. failed to deliver revenue have, that yeah. it has yes. promised. Yeah. Mm. It has left 600 million Africans mm. without mm. access to electricity mm. and a billion others without access to clean cooking. So, clearly so we are talking about us. a failed energy system mm -hmm. that has destroyed our ecosystems mm -hmm. and uh, displaced communities from their lands without compensation and caused a lot of social injustices mm -hmm. on the continent. So clearly it's not an energy system we should be depending on. Mm -hmm. We should be moving away from this system and designing a new system mm -hmm. that is based on renewables. The fossil fuel energy system is already captured by um, international, transnational mm -hmm. corporations. Mm -hmm. We need an energy system that mm -hmm. is truly African-owned, mm -hmm. African-led, that is going to help Africa yeah. address its priority needs. Yeah. And that is access to energy that will allow people to have access to modern energy services and build resilience to the climate crisis. Mm -hmm. Leah, you, you mentioned uh, the research industry is not very happy with this declaration because you'd have wanted to see more involvement of research. But there's also the argument that everything um, the, the UN system or the climate uh, system does yeah. is based on research. Yeah. And this, uh, you as researchers have been accused of painting such a gloomy and terrifying picture of climate change to the point that you're giving people this as a sata tufanyini you're giving people that hopeless yeah. kind of mindset. Yeah. How is research working to address these gaps in communication? And you know, the important thing about research is that it gives a face to the problem. It gives a context to the problem. And the interventions that, you know, um, that we come up with are better informed. Mm. And I'll just speak from experience, from engaging the policymakers who have mm. been here. And part of our project has engaged policymakers, even at the regional level, who say, wow, this is an aspect, um, we're talking about COVID-19 back then, but this is um, work that we, we did not know was going on. Mm. And based on what our key findings based on what we we, we worked on um, in that specific project um, they were able to see key areas where they could have intervened in terms of policy so there's really a dire need for that science policy interlinkage so that the the, we are providing solutions that are contextualized. We are speaking to the needs of the people. We are speaking to um, the needs of society, the vulnerable groups, and whether it be the urban poor, whether it takes a gender lens, we are still remaining relevant. Mm -hmm. So research is not all gloomy. I've seen some very interesting figures. I attended um, a session that was moderated by
by um, Her Excellency um, Gracia Marshall. And the, the figures are not so bad, um, Zainab. So <laughs> we are not all gloomy. We are just saying. The synthesis reports give us very <laughs> terrifying numbers. <laughs> the numbers are there. You know, some are even saying we are going to be extinct, extinct by a certain year. But um, most importantly is that these facts or these figures are a call to action. Mm -hmm. We've just had the discussion on fossil fuels and I couldn't help but, you know, wish that more of these voices could have spoken to such an important document. Mm -hmm. And you see the thing about declaration, Zainab, is that that is soft law. So that is not necessarily a hardline document that we are waiting to be implemented somewhere. Yes. You don't have to. You're not you compelled. Don't have You're not to, legally you know, bound and, to. And it's very mm -hmm. diplomatic. Mm -hmm. We have to admit that these processes have heavy economic interests behind them. Mm -hmm. Whether we like it or not, mm -hmm. it is our job as a, a persons in advocacy, as various um, technocrats, as the research community, it is our duty to ensure that policymakers are putting in place um, um, interventions that are going to serve the needs of the vulnerable groups in society. Mm. So now I'd like to go into the document itself. We've, uh, we also have an advanced copy and the, there are some graphics you're seeing on your screen. Those are some of the, the, the things that are in the draft document, the final document we are hoping to get it maybe later tonight or early tomorrow morning and then we'll be able to see if the draft, if it matches the draft or right. if, and see what has been removed. But one of the things it says is that collective action needed from Global North as per the declaration, act with urgency in reducing emissions, fulfilling its obligations, keeping past promises and supporting the continent in addressing climate change. And to specifically do the following, Accelerate all efforts to reduce emissions, to align goals, uh, to align with the goals set forth in the Paris Agreement that seeks to yeah. set uh, the 1.5 degree target, and honor the commitment to provide $100 billion in annual climate financing as promised 14 years ago at the Copenhagen Conference. Yeah. Now, I want to zero in on this one, $100 billion. Do you get the feeling that this is uh, kind of um, an oxymoron considering we've said we are not here to beg? Is in this begging, literally. I mean, Zainab, let me, let, let me just jump in on that and say, <laughs> you cannot beat me and tell me how to cry at the same time, yes, right? Yes. I'm going to cry however which way I will, yes. right? Mm -hmm. So um, yesterday I was just listening to um, a former UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, and he was mm -hmm. saying, um, currently it's only $11 billion that is trickling down to Africa yes. in terms of mitigation projects, mm -hmm. adaptation even, mm -hmm. um, to a limited degree. And we are talking about an ambition a hundred billion dollars now looking at the commitments and those that needs are actually so much higher by those five, needs ten are times. so much higher and yes. they are growing yes. right yes. climate change disasters happen every other day mm. so when we are talking about fa phasing out fossil fuels and we are talking about the figures we've had this morning the pledges we've had I, don't, I do not want to be pessimistic. I'm naturally a very optimistic person, <laughs> but um, yeah, we, we need to do more. Mm -hmm. Let me say, whether we are begging more, advocating more, or researching more, mm -hmm. we need to do more. Mm -hmm. You need to do more. Amos, do you see us begging in this declaration? Yeah, uh, you see, you started by reading that uh, draft declaration. Mm -hmm. And one IPCC reports mm -hmm. uh, painting a gloomy future. Actually, mm -hmm. that is a politically moderated report. Yes. If it was yes. to be yeah. as evident as it should be, mm -hmm. actually, we are on a, tra a, a very dangerous trajectory. trajectory. Yes. Um, and I understand, I, I understand that during that process of moderation, countries become very vicious yeah. in the wording. Yeah. Yeah. They say, no, 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 the, the developing world always waits for the developed world to live. Yeah. And then they start to moderate the documents. So, so those reports are not a true reflection of what we're looking at. Mm. It is worse than that. Mm. Um, Actually, we are on a trajectory to hit 2.7 mm -hmm. by end of this century. Mm -hmm. 2.7. So we are nowhere near 1.5. We are not anywhere near 1.5. Mm -hmm. And we can see at 1.1 degrees what is already happening. Yes. You see all these signs mm -hmm. and floods killing people mm -hmm. in Africa. Mm -hmm. is, we have had only 1.1 degree temperature rise. Mm -hmm. So with 2.7, Africa is going to become literally inhabitable. Mm -hmm. So that's why we are asking that because... On the trajectory that we are on, we are already suffering, and our people are losing livelihoods and lives. Mm. We need support. Mm. And the support that was pledged over 15 years ago in, in, in Copenhagen in 2009 has not been fulfilled. Mm. Global Center for Adaptation estimates that Africa will need about $52 billion every year up to 2030. Mm. 
Mm. For us to be able to adapt. Yes. yes. Kenya, we said we need 63 billion. Yes. Until 2030 for us to adapt. Mm. The, we only been offered 100 billion. That has not even come. Mm. Last year at uh, Shamal Chef, uh, there was establishment, a momentous of, the loss, moment and damage of fund. loss and damage fund. <laughs> that, that is still empty. About, yes. It's an empty basket. Mm. We need funds to trickle into that fund to be able to help communities that are um, suffering the ravages of climate crisis to adapt and to be able to rebuild their livelihoods. Mm. So we are not begging, like I said. You cost us damage. You must Just pay. be responsible. You Thank must you. pay. Yeah. <laughs> but your version of taking responsibility, you want the US to say, yes, I'm responsible for the climate impact in Africa. Is that what you want them if, to say? If, if we are calling for a true global solidarity, we saw what happened when COVID came. Hmm. The world came together to hmm. find solutions, hmm. although there was also uh, a vaccine apartheid for Africa. Uh, but are we seeing a climate apartheid where investments, for example, in renewables are still going into the rich countries. Of all the investments that are going into renewables, for example, it's only 2% that's coming to Africa. The rest is in already rich countries. So that's already an investment apartheid for Africa. So we are asking for a global solidarity to fight a global challenge. We are not begging. Yes. Grace, what does adaptation look like for Africa? Yeah, um... I would like to just take that conversation back a bit um, and talk about the principle of common uh, but differentiated, differentiated responsibilities. responsibilities. Yes. So um, we, we will not run away. Maybe you need to start by defining what you mean by common but differentiated responsibilities. Exactly. Um, so um, I believe it's already been uh, really alluded to already uh, in terms of Africa is, um, has contributed less than 4% of the carbon emissions. Mm. Um, so um, in terms of taking responsibility, the, the leaders, the Global North leaders who benefited from um, extraction of fossils should lead in this uh, response to climate change. And when we talk about leading in terms of investments, and um, I think also that um, the US is, of course you'd consider a global leader so can you show leadership as well in terms of committing uh, finances? Um, I'm very happy that uh, John Kerry talked about some funds that have been committed. Um, he gave some different baskets uh, yes. to support Africa uh, to advance uh, climate response. But we are still calling for the 100 billion annually. I feel like we are just taking um, knee-jerk reactions and uh, having these announcements at you know some of these different summits, it still does not take away from the fact that that responsi responsibility is there. Mm. So the 100 billion commitment, and it's a promise they need to deliver it. Mm. And secondly, also um, you asked about um, Africa being a beggar, and I'll also take you to the statement that I made that we have 60 percent of the resources that will be required um, in moving forward with the transition. Additional to that, Africa has the biggest um, uh, carbon sequestration. Um, we have the biggest... Uh, carbon sinks. Carbon sinks, yes. Sinks, yes, sequestration, mm -hmm. uh, I think same thing. Um, we have the human resources. So if we are trying to leapfrog this, I think for us, we are saying that we are not coming to the table without anything. Mm. We are bringing something, something, something to the table. And uh, we demand that the West also meets um, what they need to provide. And also I'll tell you, um, Zainab, um, is that the West will require the resources that we have. Mm. So we want to also come in um, to trade 
we do not want to come and beg, we want to trade. <laughs> so <laughs> Let me ask you, but do you think that as a continent, we even have the moral authority to be chastising anyone about, about wait, let me finish, I see you're about to read this. Do you think as a continent, we even have the moral authority to be chastising anyone about not paying for the losses and damage that you're suffering as a continent? Yet we as a continent are not actually, we are the same ones who are selling that, for, we are digging up that fossil fuel and selling it. We are um, not building the systems that we need. We are not building the the, enviro the bicycle lanes or planting the trees that we need. We are constantly deforest. Uh, we are cutting down trees. And when it comes to these climate conversations, we do not invest in our capacity to actually be the, at that table. So, do you think we actually have the authority to criticize anyone when we are we are not putting our best foot forward ourselves? Well, uh, that's a very interesting and very interesting observation. And I'll tell you that um, right now, um, Africa is waking up. Um, if you look at um, our setup, you realize that uh, our extraction is quite minimal mm. and um, our environment is still quite um, in, a, in a natural way such that it can support uh, the emission process. So in a sense, therefore, in as much as uh, we need to do more, I feel that um, we have the resources to be able to um, curtail um, emissions in terms of just the natural resources. And uh, secondly, also, um, I want to talk about um, the issue of uh, fossil fuels. Mm. And I'll tell you that if you look at the case of Africa across board, mm. most of our resources that we're extracting um, it is because of the interest of countries in the West. Yeah. Mm. So um, most of our resources are going to benefit the West. So in a sense, therefore, Zainab, this the interest is coming from the West. Mm. So uh, remember, we so do we're need... we're allowing ourselves to be bullied. We do need... Um, and that's why I talked about debt. Because we have a challenge in terms of debt deficit. And uh, I think our governments really try to cover the debt uh, deficit uh, by considering some of these investments. But then also we are still calling for the West to, um, to divest and to uh, stay away from... Uh, pushing investments. For instance, I'll tell you right now that we know that there are countries that are supporting gas um, extraction in countries in West Africa, like um, Senegal. Yeah. We know that there are new projects that are coming up in Ghana. Yeah. And these projects, there is a backhand of countries in the north that need this gas. Yes. So uh, I think for us, we need to make sure that we are pushing also, or we are really raising our voice to make sure that the north we stay away from these resources. I think our rallying call is uh, let um, the minerals stay on the ground. Mm. And um, if we are able to do that and build our capacity to respond, uh, to, to grow our natural resources and uh, renewable energy, mm. then I believe we'll be able to leapfrog the need for fossils. So the three of you say the Nairobi Declaration has underdelivered, but uh, Sultan uh, Al Jaber, Dr. Sultan Al Jaber, COP28 president, who has also been attending this summit, has just released a statement, and he says the Nairobi Declaration is a clear statement of Africa's determination in climate leadership, which aligns with the ambitions and priorities of COP28 presidency. The declaration is a reminder that the continent is a beacon of hope filled with potential and a global example of what pro-climate, pro-growth, and nature-positive development should look like. The presidency welcomes the support for COP28 expressed by African leaders in the declaration, and we are committed from the global south to build on the achievements of Nairobi and deliver transformative results at the summit. So basically, he says Nairobi has delivered. In short, <laughs> Africans. Can I, can, I, can I respond? Yes. Um, you see, just a few weeks ago, yeah. um, the co president released a letter. Yeah. Um, and in the letter, they were looking at tripling renewables uh, as part of the cover decision that they are looking at during COP28. Yeah. Um, in that aspect, I think. It is great that um, we are talking about um, increasing our renewable capacity on the continent. Mm. But the thing is, there's nothing unique in this declaration yeah, yeah. that would warrant heads of states calling for a summit. Yeah. Mm. Because they are repeating the same things that are nothing unique for they Africa. They keep saying at Cajos Clevel and... Yeah, <laughs> not, 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 yeah, nothing yeah. unique for Africa. Mm. What celebrating? Mm. 
when this summit was called, we knew it was a transformational moment. Yeah. Mm. But when you look at that text, you realize that it's a copy paste mm. of what we have already been discussing. Mm. The 100 billion yeah. thing, the mm. face down. Yes. You see, and all that language, nothing yeah. new or specific for Africa. Mm. So that's why we say it has not met our expectations. Mm. But in the form of mobilizing people yeah. to know about the climate issues, yeah. it has created a momentum. Yeah. Uh, we had civil society uh, uh, have a match from Nyaya Stadium to Green Park where they had a concert mm. and they had the People's Declaration. I think that is important. This has been a moment for people to realize that we are faced with a big challenge. So mm. it's been a rallying space for people to come together and mm. think together, although this is not reflected mm. in the official declaration. Yes, Leia, your thoughts on Aljaber's statement? I, I have many thoughts about the COP28 presidency, but that aside, <laughs> um, yeah. we've, we've just talked about the climate financing aspect, mm. right, and how it even fits into the declaration that we're discussing. And let me just um, briefly comment and say we also have a responsibility. Mm. I was thinking about this $11 billion mm. that has supposedly trickled down to Africa. How much of it has it gone to that woman who is struggling with the impact of climate change? Yes. How much has it gone to the vulnerable groups of people, the persons with disabilities, mm. the children who cannot attend school? Mm. I mean, there are, um, I, I read a news report where there are girls who are exchanging um, sex for water, even, you know, mm. such ravaging, imp you, you can't even tell that it would go to the societal fabric, right? There's so many people who are negatively impacted. How much does even a shilling, when you take away the per diems, mm. when you've taken people to Mombasa, when you have cut down to the very, to the local, you know, organization, mm. are these vulnerable communities getting the money that is being promised? Mm. Still, I emphasize that, yes, we need the $100 billion. If they do come, they're welcome. Mm. But we also need to strengthen our financial structures as African countries our to side, be able... To best foot forward. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. You have I will just add uh, one quick thought on, um, I think, the brief from uh, the COP28 president. Yeah. And He's I, watching, by the way. All right, He's yes, watching. so um, <laughs> I think the fact that Africans are coming up and speaking yeah. for themselves mm. is very important. Mm. So the African voice, to me, will supersede um, any other uh, thinking beyond, um, I mean, just around the summit. And uh, I will also um, um, appreciate the fact that the, the president, Al Jaber, mentioned that this time around, he strictly said that we do not want to see any other new commitments. Yes. And he said that um, let's keep to that promise. Mm. So I would like really if that can be amplified yes. um, going on even um, to COP28. Mm. I think for us, our voice comes strongly. And this time we're talking about energy issues at COP28. Yeah. So Africans we will be able to pick up on these issues, uh, on the decisions, mm. and our voice will be stronger this time. And there's also one thing that uh, you notice, uh, over the last few weeks, the, the COP28 presidency has been releasing titbits of what to expect at COP28. Yeah. And one of the things that, uh, one of the titbits that he released was that there's going to be a day to talk about climate and health, the nexus between climate and health. But you haven't seen that in the Nairobi Declaration. Mm -hmm. And people in the health sector are actually very pissed off. Yes. <laughs> after so much agitation, after mm. so much agitation mm. nothing in the declaration. Mm. And th these are the gaps that we need to address. Because trust me, Zainab, there's a lot of research that is mm. going to establish um, the nexus between climate change and health. Mm. So many organizations are funding such research. Mm. We need to amplify and these Kenya voices. is already seeing this impact. Exactly. Malaria moving into crisis exactly. didn't exist before. Exactly. Yes. Invasive species, mm. you know. Mm. We, need to, species we need to highlight. We need to highlight that, Zainab. We need to highlight that. I like the fact that um, the co-president is focusing on climate and health uh, because from an energy perspective, look at clean cooking. It's a big issue. Yeah. Mm. Indoor air pollution on this continent is killing millions of, of people uh, from uh, air pollution uh, because we're using uh, dirty and traditional uh, uh, fuels. Uh, most of the households in Africa still depend on fuel wood. So investing in an energy system that's going to provide for this will be great. But there are always distractions in this space, Zainab. You know, you've been around. Um, my colleague uh, Grace was speaking about uh, uh, um, announcements, Kerry's announcements. Always, 
these rich countries, these historical polluters, in the moments where we have to take decisions, they go outside the official mm -hmm. process mm -hmm. and announce these funds. Yes. Uh, like bilateral talks. And yeah, uh, yes. they have these bilateral engagements mm -hmm. that do not uh, engage in the most lateral process. Mm -hmm. we, but they do this when we have these processes. Multilateral, instead of committing within the multilateral process, mm -hmm. they go and engage on the sidelines. Mm -hmm. Was the Nairobi process a multilateral process? Um, it should have been. But, but, but when you look at the, those kind of announcements, and that's what I'm saying, mm -hmm. and, and, and what they entailed. At COP26, you remember, we had South African JP, yes. uh, Just Energy Transition mm -hmm. uh, Partnership, and they just announced a figure. We are giving South Africa $8.5 billion for South Africa to transition and from India coal. Demanded at the yeah. same. But they yeah. didn't say what this $8.5 billion mm -hmm. entails. Mm -hmm. Most of this money is loans, mm -hmm. and they don't get to benefit the countries. Mm -hmm. So that's why we're saying, we are engaging in a multilateral process. Please, if there are any uh, uh, pledges, they have to be made within that multilateral process because these guys have failed us. They have promised, they have not delivered. They engage in bilateral uh, announcements that they continue to interpret uh, vulnerable countries. Yes, and yet the president talked about moving out of this we are debt not beggars. system. Yes, <laughs> now, wait, Amos, I need to ask you this. Um, looking at the structure of the Nairobi talks, were they negotiations? Were they what? What was the structure of these talks? And was were there winners? Were there losers? What was the structure? Yeah, the thing is, um, the way the whole summit was uh, structured mm. uh, uh, was problematic, and we saw uh, civil society organisations writing a letter mm. and um, um, pointing out how um, Africans have not been involved in the process. Mm. Um, actually, I was expecting. The, um, um, the whole organizers of this summit would bring together Africa's stakeholders, Africa's actors from different constituents, mm -hmm. researchers, mm -hmm. uh, communities, mm -hmm. everyone to come and contribute to this African agenda. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't supposed to be a negotiated thing, but it was supposed to be a space where we all of us come mm -hmm. and define what Africa's future should look like, mm -hmm. and not just a few think tanks uh, mostly not African, mm. uh, um, and, and if they are based in Africa, not African headquartered, mm. uh, um, um, coming up and shaping what this summit and African future should be. So you believe, you go, you all go by the school of thought that, uh, you know, the criticism that has been thrown at the office of the president, that uh, the Nairobi talks were a front for the global north. You, we all of us are very <laughs> diplomatic fraud. So you all, that's what you all go by. Exactly. And um, I think um, also to add to that, Zainab, is that um, during the talks, we've now seen the change in tone mm -hmm. in terms of um, uh, reparations or the responsibility, uh, differentiated responsibility. I think I talked about that. And uh, now it's looking like everyone has a role to play, which is okay, but still uh, that uh, promise is still there. So I think there's some softening of tone in that. And also uh, the fact that um, there has been kind of a capture of the summit uh, by private interests. Mm. Uh, initially, we saw that um, the, there are some private companies which are able to influence the agenda. And they were actually part of the sponsors of the summit. Mm. And as a are civil society, these companies? <laughs> I will uh, say that we've seen McKinsey with Chikli as yes. CS, uh, civil society. Mm. We complained to the president. Mm. We have done uh, several um, letters, mm. red line letters to the president, strictly saying that we have seen that there's capture of the summit uh, and mainly uh, McKinsey, which has private interests. Mm. So if already the uh, uh, an, a, a corporate that has their own private interest is being able to influence at a very early age and at, at that large extent, mm. then we are worried about the outcomes of the summit. Yes. So in essence, we have registered our protests as CSOs. Mm. And um, I think some of these things are also reflecting in the outcome. Mm. So we feel that there was some private interest coming out. And I think for us as civil society, we speak for the people. Mm. Yes. Okay, so going back to the document itself, uh, the draft document as we've seen it, the African leaders are committing to 14 things. And uh, top on that list is developing and implementing policies, regulations, and incentives aimed at attracting local, regional, and global investment in green growth and inclusive economies. 
uh, propelling Africa's economic growth and job creation, also focusing on economic development plans in a climate positive growth, uh, strengthening uh, continental collaboration, um, advancing green industrialization, uh, redoubling efforts in agriculture, taking the lead in developing global standards, finalizing and implementing draft African Union Biodiversity uh, Framework, supporting smallholder farmers, identifying and prioritizing adaptation, uh, and then building effective partnerships between Africa and other regions, promoting investment in urban infrastructure, strengthening early warning systems, and accelerating implementation of the African Union Climate Change and Resilience Development Strategy. Now, f what I feel is missing from all of this is the how. The how. How are we going to do all these 14 things? Because if you talk about policy regulations, Kenya is already doing that. Mm -hmm. exactly we, what yesterday, the president exactly inaugurated that. three pieces of legislation. Exactly <laughs> exactly three that. pieces of, 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 of legislation, around, including the recently amended Climate Change Act. So how exactly is the, how exactly do you see do you guys see the continent um implementing this you know if if we were to talk about policies and regulations it's interesting that that's the first aspect that has been highlighted in the declaration mm. we have a lot and we have progressive laws we mm. have progressive policies our frameworks are really impressive mm. if you do a quick analysis you'll see that we have actually gone way ahead of even other countries other yes. jurisdictions mm. but the problem is where is the change we've had the the climate change act we've seen all manner even of now counties have in individual acts. Even counties have individual acts, mm -hmm. but how is it that we are still greatly impacted? It means mm -hmm. that there's a gap and that gap is in implementation. Mm -hmm. Whether it's through corruption, whether it's through, it, it's through um, political will, whether it's through the clash of interests, because when social, environmental and economic interests clash, mm -hmm. then there's no progress. Communities will still remain to be vulnerable. Groups will still be suffering from the impacts of climate change. Mm -hmm. I dare say that we'll have another Africa climate um, summit, summit. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll still be having um, hopefully a better conversation but I doubt I think the lingo will still be the same the terminologies will still be the same mm -hmm. I, I I'm not so sure what impact this declaration is going to get I've said it's very diplomatic very carefully crafted mm -hmm. um, sections even copy pasted I'm very sure <laughs> but um, <laughs> uh, 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 um, the point is to say so long as we are not committing to implement mm. these sections for the benefit of our people then we are That's still in big trouble mm. Grace do you think uh, if you look at the declaration as it is right now the draft as it is mm -hmm. do you think we're ready for COP28 well um, just looking at that uh, declaration and uh, thinking back of the outcomes of uh, COP27, um, I feel that there's a lot that needs to be done uh, in this period. Mm. So um, first of all, I'll say, I think for us as Africans, we really need to kind of think about how we are going into the COP, um, highlighting what are our you know, demands for COP27, and uh, sorry, COP28 that is, and um, there are still many issues. Uh, for instance, I think issues of loss and damage, that was mentioned, mm. but talking about operationalization of that, mm. we are still uh, you know, in, in limbo about that. Mm. So that's something that we need to carry to COP. And then um, I will also talk about issues of adaptation. I'm not an expert uh, on adaptation, mm. but I feel like um, there's still a lot more that needs to be done um, in, the, in the continent. I think for us now, we need to think about action at the continental level, mm. uh, even before we go to COP. What are some of the things that we are uh, pushing as a country, and also the, the policies that we have and allocating resources? I think that's very important. There's still a gap in terms of adaptation, and I hope one of us is an expert here could talk about that. Mm. And then um, I think uh, for us, also the other issue is in terms of finance. Um, I come from um, a background where we talk about finance, uh, financing for climate and also thinking about uh, divestment uh, from fossils. I think all these things still need uh, are proper thinking around what uh, the financial archi architecture looks like. Uh, that was touched a bit um, during the summit and it was also it's reflected uh, in the declaration. But as Africans, we also need to really 
kind of put together our thoughts in terms of what do we want to see um, in the reforms of the multi development, uh, multilateral development banks. I think that for us, uh, the money is very important. So we need to be able to follow the money and we need to have strong um, demands, especially on the MDB reforms. Mm -hmm. Then when I talk about MDB, we are talking about World Bank. Mm -hmm. We are talking about IMF. Mm -hmm. uh, we are talking about all these banks and the issue is that also uh, we have a gap in um, transparency and accountability with these banks mm. and also calling for democratic uh, approaches, especially for us as Africans. Mm. This has to come out very strongly, I think, for at COP28. Yes. Let's and talk you know about what do we want to see in these reforms mm. and um, how um, is the bank going to consider our needs, our special needs mm. as Africans? The special needs and circumstances. Yes. yes. That's always an agenda item that's struck out. <laughs> <laughs> There's never been a negotiation. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting, you've talked about the multilateral lenders, financial institutions like the World Bank. And um, at this summit, on the first day of this summit, there was a report by ActionAid that revealed that uh, this bank, such as the World Bank, have been funding fossil fuel projects around the world. And last night we did speak with somebody from the World Bank and he said that's not true. Over the last three years, if anything, they've been, um, they've invested a lot more in green energy, around, uh, in green projects around the world. So maybe we are just yet to see those impacts. But if you just look at this declaration again, it says, we as African heads of state decide um, that this declaration will serve as a basis for Africa's common position in the global climate change process to COP28 and below and beyond. So, Amos, mm -hmm. this draft as it is, is it a strong position for Africa? Um, first of all, even before the draft, the way the summit was framed, um, I think contradicts so many African common positions. Mm -hmm. Among them is the principle of common but differentiated but responsibilities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That is already contradicted mm -hmm. within the framing of this summit. How? Um, by saying that we are not victims and we are not going to beg and all that, <laughs> yes. uh, uh, we and all of us have equal responsibility. It's always the first thing the president say we are disappointed that yeah. you're not accepting this. If, <laughs> yeah, if, change if, in tone and it is kind of also informing like uh, upcoming summits, upcoming discussions. Mm. So, but so this is our, our, our leaders, our heads of state have been do, uh, they've been made docile there mm. for yes. Yeah. Yeah, so um, I think this summit, its framing is problematic when it comes to African common positions. Mm -hmm. And I wish Ephraim was here, mm -hmm. uh, yes, the, the, the chair yeah. of Africa Group of Negotiators. But you know there's nothing uh, he can say. He'll say, me, I do what the African Union yeah, uh, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then you were speaking about the how. Mm -hmm. The framing also within the summit was about markets. Mm -hmm. And if you have seen many side events and if you have seen about any negotiations, it's about oh, carbon yeah. credits. Yeah. Even yeah. Kenya had to amend the law mm -hmm. to accommodate markets. Yes. Mm -hmm. And we all know what that means. Mm -hmm. Markets means we are offering polluters permits to continue polluting. Exactly. So you believe it's greenwashing? It's, it's, it's greenwashing is uh, a false solution. It mm. disadvantages our people. We're committing to support smallholder farmers. Mm. If we are going to promote such schemes, that will take away the power from our communities, mm. from our farmers. Mm. We are going to give the power to the corporates that will continue to pollute, uh, who benefits from these credits, actually? It's consultants. <laughs> so you know when Science. you say that, you're going back to the question I ask if Africa has the moral authority to We have to the moral authority. Anyone. We have the moral authority. You <laughs> have a good percentage. What, 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 what I will say is, if it's not, um, we, if we are not involved, then it's, it's nothing about us. No. If you realize, even the exportation of fossil fuel from Africa and exploitation is the total and the shell and those multinational corporations that exploit mm. and they export in uh, collusion with our elites, mm -hmm. a few Political elites. Class. It's not the people. So <laughs> yes. that energy system is yeah. not an African energy system. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm also finding faults with this process of mm -hmm. the Africa Climate Summit. Mm -hmm. Because so many delegates were locked out, yes. especially civil society. Mm -hmm. yes. And if you are not involving the people, you cannot say, this is about the people. So what was the other contradiction? You, you mentioned one contradiction, common but differentiated responsibility. What's the other contradiction? The, contradi the other contradiction is about uh, businesses. Yeah. Mm. We can't be transacting our, uh, our businesses and selling our people and our resources. We are saying, come, and, and, and we are ready to sell ourselves to you. We have everything here. We have resources. I don't think that's uh, something that we should be advocating for. Mm. And then about um, uh, banking all 
our climate finance mm. demands on market. Mm -hmm. uh, it will not be a great thing. Mm. We need to ask for other sources of funding. And one of those is loss and damage. Yeah. Loss and damage, we, Africans have fought for a loss and damage for, for a long time. time. Yes, and we got years. it at mm. an African COP last year. Mm. It will be very bad for us a year later yeah. to come and say, Okay, we are equal, equally yeah. responsible yeah. for the crisis. Yeah. We don't need that fund yeah. anymore. Yeah. After we fought all this year, it contradicts mm. mm. uh, the African position mm. that we are vulnerable, we need support in terms of loss and damage funds. So yeah. this uh, summit's framing has contradicted so many African positions. Mm. So let me ask you, uh, Grace, what is your alternative Nairobi declaration? Um, my alternative uh, Nairobi declaration um, what I would want to see is the voices of the people. So, um, number one, can we talk about the needs of the people, the marginalized, marginalized communities, the women? How can we put their needs at the center of um, the summit, the declaration? I feel that this summit, uh, the, the outcome of the summit and the declaration as a whole needs to be people-centered. And I believe that we need to carry this forward beyond COP28 and many other negotiations and processes that we are having. We need this process to be African, people-centered. And I think um, the fact that we are talking about Africa is open for business. Yeah. Are we open for business that is going to benefit people? Yeah. Are we open to business that is going to make sure that uh, Mama Mboga uh, is able to uh, improve their livelihoods? Are we helping people um, who are in the last mile, who are in a village somewhere uh, in Chebarbar, who doesn't have access to um, health sanitation. services, sanitation, yeah. Yeah. because maybe they don't have power or you know, they're not able to pay. Yeah. So for me, I expect that this summit will um, trickle down or uh, you know, kind of build on uh, the gap um, and also respond to the needs of the African person, mainly um, in terms of improving livelihoods, in terms of um, just uh, systems, uh, in terms of uh, finance, and in terms of also energy access. Mm -hmm. And uh, generally, I think making um, the system and the entire discussion work for the people, mm -hmm. that is what I would like to see. Okay. Leah, your alternative declaration? Um, I, I, I think it's also an inclusive one, and an innovative one, because we need to look at innovative ways of incorporating the African agenda. As you've seen, the heavy interests that are involved, the heavy parties, the things that we, we, in as much as we know what is supposed to be done, what is supposed to go into such an important document, we know that that is highly unlikely. So we need to be innovative as African countries to um, see how can climate financing um, thrive through public-private partnerships, for example. Mm. How can vulnerable communities greatly benefit? Mm. Yes. Mm. Amos, your alternative declaration? Uh, my alternative declaration would be about uh, breaking the traps that Africa has been under for a very long time. Mm. Among them is Africa uh, is known for a supplier of raw materials. Mm. We supply our oil, our flowers, and everything raw, and then we import Finished, finished products, products like at, at a very expensive rate. Mm. Yes. So we are losing a lot. Yeah. So an alternative declaration would speak to industrial policy in Africa mm. that empowers Africa not to be the supplier of raw material, but also producer of its own uh, value added mm. uh, products. Mm. For example, well now we are talking about the transition mm. to renewables. And most of the critical minerals, the uh, uh, minerals, strategic minerals that would be used in the production of equipment, mm. the solar panels, and mm. all the equipment that are meant to help the world transition mm. are in Africa. Mm. Why can't we produce these equipment in Africa and supply the rest of the world? The technology transfer is problematic. <laughs> the thing is, this declaration should have demanded mm. for the growth in the global north mm. so that all the industries, the industrialized Germany, the industrialized Europe, mm. so that the industries come and produce the equipment in Africa mm. so that we are able not just to provide raw materials, but we are selling them equipment, but also developing our own systems that are able to help us harness the rich resources that we have, the sun, the wind, mm. the geothermal. Mm. So no, that like would have been 
an alternative declaration. Le, you look like you also have I, something to say. I wanted to quickly quote Professor Leslie from the University of Cape Town, and this mm. is what she said. Mm. It is time we embraced African environmentalism because this speaks to our specific context. Um, the, the issue about research is that most times the facts and figures that we rely on are Western produced. Mm. Exactly. They, they, right. they are not... researchers are... Our own researchers are out of the picture. We do not mm. have data, facts, and figures that speak that speak the African story. However, and I should mention that AR6, the sixth uh, IPCC assessment report, has a chapter on Africa, mm. written by at least 12 uh, African uh, writers, including some Kenyan writers. Yes. So at least now we are starting to see some progress. Yes. We, we are starting to see some progress, mm. but still we need the African evidence to be consolidated, to mm. specifically tell, I think it was um, Sahir who was saying that some of, even the IPCC report is politically, yes. you know, driven. It's mm. a politically driven process. Mm. We need research that will speak the African story. Yeah. Uh, the, when you speak of African stories, there's, um, you know, the way for the longest time we were told Kibera is the largest slum in Africa. Mm -hmm. It has uh, two million, uh, was it a million Absolutely, dwellers. absolutely. Only for Kenya to do a census and realize, oh no, not even close. <laughs> Mm, not even close. Yeah. So when we go to COP28, as we begin to wrap, up, wrap up this conversation, when we go to COP28, I'd like to start with you, Grace. What would be your key ask for COP28? Yeah, um, thank you, Zaina. So uh, for me, um, I will have um, three key asks, and I will let my colleagues also add um, to that. I think number one ask is going to be uh, operationalization of the loss and damage band. Let's make it work. Let's um, put money in the fund, and let's come up with modalities uh, for this money to reach people. Mm -hmm. And number two, um, I'm going to talk about uh, the MDB reforms. Mm -hmm. I am uh, someone who follows the money as well. So um, let us uh, rethink the financial architecture. Let's make um, these resources available to um, you know African countries Let's not make uh, debt unfair. Let's not make debt pull people down. Let's help uh, African community, African uh, nations to be able to access these resources to respond to climate change. Because I think right now, um, a lot of our GDP is going to respond to uh, climate uh, risks. So let's make uh, the financial architecture work for the people. So I think number two is, um, MDB reforms, making um, finance accessible, affordable, and available to African nations. Yeah. And uh, third, I'm going to talk about um, a just energy transition. Um, and um, I think we are still calling uh, for in bringing um, energy access to 100% yeah. and coming up with a roadmap for us as Africans on how we are going to make this transition work. So calling for uh, resources, technology, and all the possible support uh, to operationalize uh, African, uh, an African transition roadmap. Mm. Yep, mm. thank you. Great. And what's your ask for COP28? Yeah, um, last year at COP27, there was just transitions work program mm. that was established. Mm -hmm. uh, within that work program, I think uh, some of the things that should be coming out from COP28 mm. is since the COP28 uh, presidency, is deliberate about tripling renewables capacity mm. in the world, we should not be seeing what we are seeing right now, mm. that all the investments in renewables mm. are still going in developed rich countries. Mm. Um, my colleagues said they are not developed countries. We are all still developing in different ways. So I call them rich countries. Mm. Um, these funds need also to come to Africa. We need to increase investments in Africa's renewables within the Just Transitions uh, framework. Um, then there was also a loss and damage fund mm. established mm. at COP27. So there was a lot of progressive things at COP27. Mm. We need to establish on how this fund is going to be resourced. Maybe tax the polluters, mm. make rich historical polluters pay, mm. and all those. We need to establish a mechanism of how we are going to resource this fund. Mm. And these funds should be channeled to the vulnerable communities mm. in developing countries exactly. of each Africa has the majority. Mm. We need to double our adaptation funding. Most of the funding is going into mitigation, mitigation programs. Yes, yeah. mm. We need to double our adaptation because Africa is highly impacted. And 
we are losing livelihoods. We are losing life. We can no longer uh, dilly dally about it. We have to increase funding towards adaptation. So those are the expectations that I have. But the thing is, uh, in the spirit of just transition, uh, we have 600 million Africans who still do not have access to electricity. Uh, as part of um, increasing renewables investments, these 600 million Africans need to have access by 2030. And of course, we should stop um, holding back on a call for phase out of all fossil fuels. I don't, that's a big call for COP28, yeah. considering what UAE but, is, but, but that would be a big UAE thing. The UAE refuses to accept that criticism. The UAE refuses to accept that criticism that they chose a fossil, uh, fossil fuel person yeah. or a, a fuel person to head the COP. They say he has spearheaded a lot of uh, renewable problem. energy, including Mazda, this company that uh, just recently <laughs> opened in Kenya. Yes, I know Mazda is coming to invest in Africa and all that, yeah. but we know that 75% of the problem that we have has been caused by fossils. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't think um, UAE will referee uh, in a game where the outcome is facing out all fossil fuels. But I'm hopeful that that can happen. If that happens, it will be historic. <laughs> Leo, ask the COP28. I almost asked him where he got the 600 million from, but I believe that's an African, <laughs> an, an African figure. Um, let's accelerate locally led adaptation mm -hmm. because this is what is going to as greatly assist vulnerable communities. Let us strengthen the ability to even relate to the impacts of climate change. Mm -hmm. Accelerating locally led adaptation and strengthening resilience at the community level. Yes. You mentioned locally led adaptation, and uh, Kenya is running a locally led adaptation, the Flocker project, financing locally led adaptation, as funded by the World Bank. Yeah. And it's one of the things that the president was flagging off yesterday. But one concern that the Flocker managers have raised is that there are three county, counties that are non responsive, yeah. mm -hmm. Nairobi being one of them. Yeah. Yet Nairobi has hosted the climate summit. Yeah. Nairobi has not, because one of the things you need to do in order to qualify for that funding is you need to have community climate committees, you need to have a, com a county climate act, yeah. and you need to have a county climate uh, climate plan yeah. so that then the flocker gives you the money to implement. Nairobi, Mombasa, and Kiambu have been non-responsive. Yeah. But at least Kiambu ha is, ha is making some progress. They, are, they have an act already. They're trying to put together. But Nairobi hosted the climate summit. <laughs> but and and not, gave a declaration. And gave a declaration. Uh, is, does that mean that then Nairobi doesn't feel the? And there's something you know. Someone was arguing that perhaps the policymakers they they don't have the capacity. And someone said, no, government has some of the br most brilliant people. Yes. Mm -hmm. So yes. it's just a matter of. Either, I don't want to say laziness. That's too harsh. Mm -hmm. But this is something that needs to be done. And once we do not have these structures in place to mm -hmm. access such an important program. Mm -hmm then that tells a lot. Yes, because even Mombasa has not uh, responded. It does not surprise me that the three counties are urban and peri-urban uh, counties. <laughs> you see, normally when we look at adaptation mm. and resilience, we look at farmers yeah. and mm. think that it's just about mm. rural economies. Yeah. But, Kiambu is uh, a farming community. Say that? Kiambu is a farming is community. Yeah, uh, but yeah. it's peri-urban. Mm. Uh, my assumption is that I think we are not seeing the impacts of climate change in our cities. It floods here in Nairobi. We've lost all life the time. all the all time. The time. Uh, we need to put up infrastructures that are resilient. Mm -hmm. uh, the roads, mm -hmm. the drainage system. Mm -hmm. uh, when it rains, we lose our electricity all the time. Yes. Even our energy system is not climate resilient. Mm -hmm. So I think the thing, this resilient and adaptation thing is a farmer's thing. And that's why probably they have not taken it keenly. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you very much, uh, gentlemen and ladies, for joining this discussion. The Africa Climate Summit has uh, has just, um, uh, has today is the last day of the Africa Climate Summit. The Nairobi Declaration, the draft document, has been adopted. But the main document, the official document itself, we're hoping to see it uh, later this evening or early tomorrow morning and then see what has been deleted, what has been included. And maybe some of the concerns we've been raising here will also be included in the final document. I'd like to thank my panelists today, Grace Rono, for making time, Thank Lea Aoko for making time, and Amos Femanya. Unfortunately, the, the African group of negotiators could not join us, but mm. at some point we are going to catch up with him because the Nairobi Declaration will be taken as the African position. Yes, so we will need to talk to him about what this means for them 
as the African negotiators, the people who will be leading the discussions at COP28 on behalf of Africa. My name is Zena Bondat and on behalf of the Nation Media Group, I'd like to thank you for joining this special coverage of the Africa Climate Summit from 6 a.m. Monday morning all the way to this point. Thank you very much for following this discussion. But we are not done. We are still promising you exciting coverage in our bulletins tonight as well as in the newspapers tomorrow. And then tomorrow we pick up the coverage for the Africa Climate Week. Now that the heads of state, the, the heads of state Maneno is, is out of the way, now we can do the Raya stuff. Yeah, and look at the people, yes, we can do the Raya stuff and yeah. look at the Africa Climate Week and look at the solutions, some of the solutions that are on display at this Africa Climate Summit and the Africa Climate Work, Climate Week. On behalf of the team that has facilitated this production, the team that has enabled this, made it possible for us to be on air this long, I thank you and see you in the bulletins tonight.